And now during the interval we have the last of ten conversations in which the late Dr. Jacob Bronowski related to George Steedman his personal account of the discoverers and philosophies of the twentieth century. Last week Dr. Bronowski considered man as a most successful mammal. This week he describes the importance of being highbrowed. The programme is introduced by George Steedman. You're an optimist, and we, we've talked of the growth of scientific ideas, where, if you like, chronologically, in our conversation, we've got to about now. As, as the captions say, wither science. Of course, I think that science is at a most exciting place. I'm happy to be alive in the 20th century. I'm very happy to have been part of the uh, great outburst of physics around about 1930. And I'm happy to be part of the great outburst of uh, the life sciences since 1953. Uh, to have lived through two such revolutions almost makes up for my having lived through the two great catastrophes of the 20th century, the rise of Hitler in 1933 and the dropping of the atomic bombs in 1945. So I think that's kind of fair. They pose the problem that man's increasing knowledge of physical nature has created. And we have to match it by a self-knowledge, which is what I'm interested in. So may I talk about myself for a moment? I don't care what is going on in number 10 Downing Street, in the White House, in Jerusalem and Cairo, which seems so important to the newspapers, because the men that I have spent my life with have said little things on bits of paper, sometimes written in mathematics and sometimes written in poetry which will shape the future of the human race far more profoundly than those silly political decisions. Power is very evanescent, but knowledge is a tremendously compressed charge which waits for the future and in the end creates the Russian Revolution, reshapes the intellectual revolutions of the world and that's happened in my lifetime. That's why I think knowledge is far more important than power. Now, I've had unique opportunities to put my knowledge into channels which haven't been open to others. By the chance of the parents that I was born of, by the good luck that the thing I could do best was mathematics, which is the universal key to all the sciences, which is the greatest gift that God gave me. I have a better sense of what science might do than anyone who talks about ecology or bombs or the Alaska pipeline or what's going on in Africa. I see both science and the arts now teaching at a very important moment in the history of the human mind. And that moment is called self-understanding. A hundred years ago, physics was being reshaped. Twenty years ago, biology was being reshaped. Twenty years from now, our understanding of the human personality will be reshaped. And I have spent the last 10 years at the Salk Institute in trying to lay the foundations from which that should be done. So if you will permit me a moment of pure exposition of my own work, I will tell you what it's about. I sit in a room much like this and I read about the experiments that other people have done More often I read about the most interesting things that they've done, the poetry they've written, the dramas they have performed. I read about old cultures. 
Sometimes I suggest an experiment that people should do. But I don't run around and dissect rabbits or tell people how to make pigeons peck at targets or rats run mazes. Because, to tell you the truth, I think pigeons and rats are wonderful, but not at all lovable. And I am in love with the human race. Of course, there are things you can make rats do that it would be Hitlerian to make humans do. I don't believe in any of that. You see, I don't think that science exists in order that we should be able to su apply our superior knowledge to tell somebody else to have fewer babies or smoke less or, you know, eat more kippers uh, or make more love. I think that science exists in order to say to people, these are the opportunities. And with those opportunities, remember what makes you different from the rat. Then let's not talk about a nasty animal like the rat. Let's talk about a nice, good animal like, uh, oh, um, a dog. dog. Dogs are nice. They're really very nice. Highly specialized in the evolutionary sense for highly adapted for being man's slave. Well, that's what we think. The dogs think that they've adapted man to feed dogs, and that's the smartest thing the dogs have done. <laughs> the dog is the oldest domesticated animal that we have, and I don't think it's a domesticated animal at all. I think there were dogs around, but we know that there were dogs around more than 12,000 years ago, and... Uh, you believe they walked in and took over? Well, they were smarter than that. They were like women. They never let on to the fact that they were taking over. I mean, they're just like wives. They take command of you while pretending all the time to be submissive and obedient. I mean, the dog is the creature that says, I obey, and winks at the clergyman with the eye that you can't see, just like your wife. So I prefer talking about dogs to talking about rats. Now, dogs are very smart. They have quite elaborate habits, they are well adapted to human ways, and yet they lack certain biological features, of which the chief one is that they have no big frontal lobes, you know, just behind the forehead, such as we have. Uh, human beings, uh, when they want to say nasty things about intellectuals like you and me and those who are listening to us, say that they are eggheads or highbrows. And by that, they mean that they are creatures with big frontal lobes. We don't know exactly what the frontal lobes we do. We don't know anything very exactly. It seems to be fairly clear that they form associations and connections and images. They, they, they pick up information and match it against other information. They make behavior into patterns. They take the past and pattern it so that it's usable for the future. They organize behavior. And uh, if you do an operation, as people foolishly did 20 or 30 years ago, in which you cut off the frontal lobes from the rest of the brain, you get an extremely happy animal that you still call a man, but that's quite incapable of making any future directed decisions. I'll give you a very simple example. Ordinarily, if you show a dog a biscuit in one hand and nothing in the other, and you then close your two hands, the dog will go to the hand with the biscuit right away. But if you hold the dog for a minute or so, it won't go to the hand anymore unless it can smell the biscuit, because it doesn't have the kind of frontal lobes which make it possible to store where it ought to go. If you do the same experiment with a monkey, he will remember for hours. But if you damage the monkey's frontal lobes, he'll be back with the dog and the rat and the other animals. And so if you do that to human beings. From that organization of behavior, there comes a whole sense of future-directed activity which is peculiar to man. Man is able to make plans because the frontal lobes make it possible for him to take the past, rearrange it, hold it, and use knowledge as potential power. 
many people think of science as being a problem-solving activity. Scientists themselves like to think of that. That's nonsense. The many years ago, you spoke of it in that way, I think. I, science as prediction, I remember, 25 years ago, you were upholding. That's right. But if you think of prediction as really simply being the solving of problems, it takes this form. What will I be doing 24 hours from now? The answer to that is, I don't care how much you know, you don't know the answer to that. You see, science consists of predictions, yes, but they have to be predictions organized on what scientists call theories and what humanists call strategies, values, modes of conduct, moral behavior, ethics. Those are long-term views of how you should shape your conduct. Now, I have made all these preliminaries in order to say that it's actually the way that our brains as human beings are made, which make us possible to do science by forming theories, very provisional theories, and by creating ethical values. How does it come about that scientific theories appear to have a rigor which ethical judgments don't have? And the answer is that it takes you a lifetime to discover that neither of them have rigor. All that they have is very great provisional strength. They have the power of knowledge. You can act on them. Well, that's the sort of view of human life that I have been trying to form at the Salk Institute. I think that science turns out to be a great ethical construct. Yes, it's right for people to say, are we following the direction that nature prescribed? But the question is, are we following the direction that nature seems to have prescribed for us? Dictatorship, intolerance, making judgments which seem to give to theory a factual status which it doesn't possess, dogma, doctrine, those are anti-scientific, anti-poetic, anti-human in every sense. They belong to Stalin and Hitler and the ants. How far did we get as we journeyed round your 20th century skull? We're reaching the end of the journey. What is the conclusion of the Voyager? The Voyager speaks from the 1970s. He hasn't yet reached the end of the 20th century. And I think this is a very important point in the 20th century and in the history of this civilization. The 20th century has something to be proud of. Western civilization has something to be proud of. What? That it has taken the convictions of past centuries, which is that man is a profoundly imaginative and spiritual animal, and it has given them a foundation of scientific fact and theory which never existed before. That's what this discussion has been about. That's why we began by taking such pains to uncover the wonderful scientific ideas about the physical universe, the relativity of time and space, the uncertainty or tolerance of our description of minute matter, the fragile, evanescent structure of the atom. And having taken those to the year 1940, we then said, and then the big balloon went up. What was the big balloon? The big balloon was applying the same methods of exactness and analysis to the way in which life is put together. My great dead friend Leo Szilard wrote to me the most beautiful sentence about biology. He said, what we physicists brought into biology was the conviction that anything that exists in nature, man can understand. That's why I'm sitting here. 
And that's why I'm anxious to talk, because if Western civilization will have turned out to have made any contribution, it stands on the knife edge now in the 1970s. Either the West will go down, and then people will say, it was a wonderful civilization. It knew everything about physics and knew nothing about life. And then I'm now playing the archaeologist of 500 years from now. And he will say, why well, didn't know about life? Oh, the life sciences were developed, he will say, in China, in Africa. He will say, well, that isn't really true. There was this man, Francis Quick, he wasn't Chinese. There was this man, James Watson, he wasn't African. And the archaeologists will say, yes, but they didn't understand him. It was the Chinese and the Africans who made that into a profound science. And I think that's really in front of us. And you know, if it happens, I won't drop it here. You know, I don't think it's anything very special that uh, Euclid and Newton happen to have had white skins rather than colored skins. But I think it's very sad if we miss the chance, Western civilization in general, contemporary civilization in general, if we miss the chance to enter biology with this new sense of giving a foundation for the human personality. Of course, we speak of Western civilization, but of course the intellect you're talking of results in universal statements that can be taken by anybody. And that derive from a hundred different civilizations. I am at this moment looking at a clock face to tell me how much time we have left to talk about. And every one of those figures I can recognize as the modern equivalent of something invented by the Arabs. And if I look at it more closely, I can even see that the Arabs stole it from the Indians and how they changed it when they stole it. That's called cultural transference. And I'm very proud of that. You know, I'm much more interested in the Arabs' invention of numerals than in any argument about the Suez Canal. Why do you think there is this loss of nerve? Because the West has not sufficiently taken up the lesson that in science there exists an inspiration for literature and the arts as well. We simply have a long tradition by which people in the arts read literary works from the time that they're at school. By the time they go to university, they no longer know the vocabulary. And even poems that are full of science, like the poems of John Donne, for instance, they simply don't understand the imagery. They don't understand that the image of the compasses, for instance, in a famous poem by John Donne, is not just a neat conceit about Oh, you know, the man actually talks about compasses. Ha ha, he must have been in some metal workshop. They don't mm. understand that that man saw the world in those scientific symbols. I'd like to read you a final statement about this. So far we've spoken only about things that I've never said before and you've never said before, but that represent what I believe. But. There's one thing about the scientific imagination, a few sentences that I wrote, uh, which I would like to read. What makes the biological machinery of man so powerful is that it modifies his actions through his imagination. It makes him able to symbolize, to project himself into the consequences of his acts, to conceptualize his plans, and to weigh them one against another as a system of values. We as men are unique. We are the social solitaries. We are the creatures who have to create values in order to elucidate our own conduct so that we learn from it and can direct it into the future. That was the late Dr. Jacob Bronowski in the tenth of his conversations with George Steedman. The series was recorded by the transcription services of the BBC, and this was the last recording Dr. Bronowski made for the BBC before his death in August of last year.